Hello world of YouTube and welcome to the listening log update for May of 2023. I've got nine more new albums that I spun in May that I'll be talking about today with time codes listed in the description if you want to jump around to a specific album. There was a decent amount of stuff that dropped in May that piqued my curiosity, but there were some catch-ups that also were coming through on parts of this month as well. As always, thank you for watching these. Give it a like if you're excited and let's go ahead and talk about said new albums. Now the first album I checked this month was a catch-up of an album that flew completely under my radar, but is the band Shame with their new album Food for Worms, following up what I would argue was a great collection of well-written post-punk inspired jams with Drunk Tank Pink with Food for Worms, an album that definitely is a harsh sonic pivot, but one that doesn't see the band's songwriting taking a kneecap to a more groovier pivot. In fact, I would argue it helps enhance some of those more tongue-in-cheek ideas a lot more overtly in ways that I think are very lovely melded together. That mood from Drunk Tank Pink still does resonate in nice doses of subtlety and more overt ways, you know, like in the opening parts of Fingers of Steel, which swerves into more of the, I would call it jangly, dance-driven atmospheres that a lot of this album more leans into. It melts perfectly with that aforementioned energy on Alibis, a song that lyrically explores the distrust one can see in someone close to them, which kind of helps permeate and extend some of the overall thematics throughout this of moving on past the point of someone else in your life that's refusing to really grow as a person, which is a pretty strong sentiment that helps, again, er enrich that sonic pivot to a degree. Like, that's kind of a follow-through on Fingers of Steel and how one's own sort of change in lifestyle via, like, prescription drugs can change them in the form of Adderall, end of the line, a track that has this really strong refrain throughout it that I think builds to a good crescendo, especially coming off of the heels of the more electrifying alibi. They do a good job of having a sort of full circle moment to that ideology with different person where it almost feels like it's written from the opposite side of that coin. You know, seeing somebody who's just completely evolved as a person and become someone else entirely. It's also an example of sonically them toying with this more foreboding twist on the groove driven nature that they want to craft on here. This album is surprising while being what I would have hoped to have seen from a band like this. It evolves their sound in ways that I think were executed fantastically. Again, I like a lot of what they do with this more groove-oriented nature. The bass work on here is pretty fucking fun, and the drums keep a good pocket with that. I also think that them diving more into these lighter, brighter sounds lend to some cool moments on top of that. You know, while tracks like The Fall of Paul definitely lean more into some of those aspects from Drunk Tank Pink that I enjoyed, Orchid, the track before it, is this much more jangly infused track that I think is so beautifully constructed. I think that the refrain definitely resonates the influence that they're tapping into very well. That jangly atmosphere feels very well utilized there. And I think that the imagery of staring into the sun on top of that jangly atmosphere adds to this sort of twist on the unforeboding that this album does well. I think that that same sort of grand swell buildup is executed masterfully on the closer of this album, All the People. It's that same kind of grand yet intimate feeling crescendo that I praised the likes of like Black Country New Road last year. It's just strong as hell, man. I think that while some of these switch-ups can definitely lead to some tonal whiplash moments what the band's got going down on this is strong nonetheless i think that if you enjoy more jangly inspired music and you want to see a little more bite into that give this shame album a listen i think that it sticks to the landing more often than not i definitely give this like an eight out of ten this is some glowing adoration i really appreciate this 
and I think that it's pretty fucking strong. Wait, which Marcus? Cause it can't be yes, our Marcus. The same Marcus we collected Pokemon cards with. The In a year where Macklemore decides to adapt his sound to sound behind the times, Jack Harlow, I guess, kind of felt it upon himself to now pivot himself into the shoes that he uh, once stood in, he being Macklemore, with Jackman, his newest pocket project that sees him pivoting away from overtly pop-driven songs outright. It's still got hooks, you know, tracks like They Don't Love It and Is That Ite and Gang... Really, half this project still has, like, hook-driven stuff. He's just adding a little more of a boom bat filter on the beats he's rocking with. He's really trying to tighten up his flow, pivot his lyrical subject matter into realms that are, in some instances, more socially driven, while being an example of who he's calling out in the same breath. I don't know if he's doing this ironically or not, but I would argue not. And I'm not saying this is somebody who has been called out on this project as somebody who talks about hip hop on the internet, but as somebody who is also a white rapper, kind of speak critically of dudes of the same caliber. And I think that he's really trying to put himself up on this pedestal while washing away any criticisms that he could be facing about kind of speaking in the stance that he is, at least from Jump. Because Common Ground, it's the first track on here, and it's really going there, talking about the increase of the white population listening to hip-hop and relation to said subject matter. Man, it's that nappy-headed handsome guy, something that you can't deny. Breaking down those barriers and finding common ground amongst uh, people in your community. Great message. Couldn't be more supportive of putting the unity within community. The posturing he puts himself on Again, by having tracks like, Is That I and Gang Gang Gang, kind of putting that same posturing within his own realm. On top of that, it feels like he's really trying to not only fill Macklemore's shoes with how he tackles socially driven stuff, he wants to tap into Mac Miller's shoes in the worst sort of way. Something about his actual inflection on here feels so different from the Jack Harlow that I'd been spinning in pockets throughout the last couple of years. I've never been the biggest Jack Harlow fan. I think he's a very average white rapper doing average white rapper things. And this is sort of another benchmark in that pedestal. It's a project that sort of gets more admiration for his sort of pseudo lane switch up Parts of this read like 2000s nostalgia within themselves. I mean, hell, Questions itself, the outro of this, is a track that was made a handful of times throughout the 2000s by the likes of J.D. Kiss and 50 Cent. It's also a subject matter that's done so very much within the genre itself, along with tracks like They Don't Love It and Ambitious with see him reflecting on his fame and his rise to prominence. I mean, Jack Harlow has become this big name uh, in, the, in the game since I last covered him on here. I may have not talked about his last couple of records, uh, but what snippets I sampled of them were my bag. And what I think is interesting about this is it feels like he's trying to start off in a big posture while going into his own problems and hopes of seeking acceptance on the same principle with tracks like Gang Gang Gang, uh, which and Is That I, which talk about his more problematic side of his personality, uh, which I think is an interesting, bold choice to make. I just don't think the tracks are that good. That's my biggest criticism of this project, is that while his flow is definitely tight on this project and there aren't really bars as overtly cringy as stuff like Sweet Sweet Semen, I wouldn't say the way that he presents the subject matters he wants to talk about are done in a way that I would say is holistically well done. And I think that that's partially because I just don't think he's that great of a rapper. He's not the worst rapper doing it, but I wouldn't say he's in my top 15 by a decent margin. Uh, tar talking like vets and new guys doing it. This is getting like a 4 out of 10. It's really short. That's the biggest compliment I can give it. The beats aren't really bad, 
Uh, in fact, I think that, again, that instrumental palette that I feel like Logic has been kind of toying with on his recent projects, but not quite as sterilized, do their job at creating a tapestry for Jack Harlow that I think is pretty decent. Uh, they're, they're decent enough, but not nothing top tier by any stretch of the imagination. It's a record that tries... Uh, but maybe a bit too hard in a, too, in a few too many different ways for how brief it is. It's an album I won't be revisiting much post this review's dropping, but are we really that surprised? Frame in the driver's cataclysm, when the beat nicks rip deep the strong chords and the slum wars, fun wars, the race rants, and the full struck of his times, and the strain of... Abstract rap icon Bus Driver is an artist that's kind of cropped up a handful of times on the channel in recent weeks. Uh, he was a part of the Best Albums of 2002 video I dropped last month. He also cropped up on the Best Hemes Features list that I dropped. Uh, and I, I do like Bus Driver. I think that he is a well-versed rapper who is always a surprise. You know, while he is somebody that I would say has a very sharp pen game, he also channels that in some very just abstract ways. You know, he is a guy whose flow is as unhinged as his poetic nuance. That's not to say that it leads to a discography just as unhinged across the board, because he does rein in those ideas into some real genius in the form of temporary forever as i talked about in my 2002 albums video but also in like recent outings like thumbs and perfect hair and made in love is very much in the vein of his more out there places that his discography can go and while i do enjoy uh, a decent chunk of this for how wonky and unhinged it gets in construction it still has a lot of what i like about bus driver as a rapper it's just done in a very contemporary twist on the abstract hip-hop album and that's cemented from jump with the track elsewhere and elsewhen which is this track that has this beat that sounds like it's on fire and crawling while bus driver just lets his foot on the gas with his flow that just blends around this beat like a whirlwind and that same kind of slow crawl with his fast delivery is a good embodiment of some pockets of the record but the album as a whole leans more into this sort of spacious jazzy vibe that i think bus driver handles with a lot of tactfulness you know while the lo-fi production definitely uh helps enhance burying his like voice amongst his whirlwind flow uh, amidst tracks like live jazz and works and return to chillsville like button is an example where his voice kind of hits that beat in a good in a good succession and it sort of streamlines his flow in pockets but there's a lot more of uh that abstract leaning bus driver energy that i do enjoy but i will say as a fan of a handful of his other records that rein that in a bit more uh across the board i do enjoy those you know i like what he's spinning and like the metaphors amongst live jazz uh, i think that his writing on jonison is a point where it kind of shines even brighter uh, that's a live performance that he injected into here that kind of fits the spacious atmosphere very well he, he kind of keeps it socially leaning on that track but in a very abstract poetic bus driver way you know this is this is showing him as like just a long-standing vet just pulling together his own brand of modern-ish adjacent abstract energy because like i said the the aforementioned sort of rhythm that sounds like it's on fire with elsewhere and elsewhen and returned to, or and like buttoned um i like that he also kind of leans more into this sort of almost like i don't want to say tom waitsian but very much like less kinetically focused delivery uh like on lady thursday where he kind of leans into this more like sing tamarish style delivery which isn't like uncommon for him i will say it's my it's not my favorite way that he pulls together tracks but uh, he brings together a sort of low, raspy energy on My World's Woman to close out the album that I think gives it more of like a Tom Waitsian energy that I think is kind of interesting to see injected amidst the spacious atmospheres 
that the track has going on. I don't know. There's a lot of energy on here that I do like, but I will say it's not my favorite bus driver project. I do think that it's, again, it's for the, the diehard fans for sure. They'll get a lot of this. If you enjoy, like, abstract hip-hop, or even if you like jazz music and you like wonky jazz and you want to hear, like, a hip-hop version of that, this new Bus Driver Project, Made in Love, is, is a pretty solid one, in my opinion. I give it, like, a 7. It's got some moments that I think are really cool. It's got some ideas, uh, lyrically, that I think Bus Driver pulls together pretty amicably. Uh, and I, I like the energy. I just more prefer when he reins it in a bit more across a project, you know what I mean? And that's a shame, that's what made me hot. Now we in a savory spot. Saltier than ever we I've actually been spinning IDK in my free time since sampling Simple and I didn't even know F65 was coming out but the minute I saw that it dropped I was fucking hyped because my biggest problem with Simple was that it was simple it was very straightforward and very short it was very brief it was a simple sample size having this aesthetic up front of leaning into like Formula One racing while pairing that with your own observance of the world as he did on Simple. I think that's a recipe for an interesting project, especially given I think Catronata's production really worked well with IDK's blend of uh, singing and rapping. And I think that him adorning that sort of Formula One Gran Turismo astonic palette is a cool idea that I think does showcase in some prominence on this project. And I like that this feels like an album nurtured. It feels like an album that he definitely thought out a lot of the ideas of it, leading to this much longer, more conceptually fruitful experience, not just by being bookended so masterfully by Cape Coast, which is named after a cape in Africa where the sort of transatlantic slave trade happened in tandem with having that classy ass backdrop uh the closer freetown straight up just sounds like menu music from gran turismo and i think that while it stays a much more upfront influence in just as stark a ways like on the opener with tracks like DSTP going into Mr. Police, talking more up front about police brutality while DSTP, the intro to that, just almost a chant from rapper Boosie Badass saying fuck the police. It also crops up on the Rich the Kid and Snoop Dogg collaborations of 850 and Middle Passage. Middle Passage straight up just being a story by Snoop Dogg about how he and his wife got married via advice from Tupac. And 850 blends that sort of trap influence with it which is something else that does crop up on pockets of here like on thug tier which i think does it a bit better than the rich the kid collaboration but i also think does it better than salty with nle Chop choppa i just don't like the beat of that song and i think that the fusion doesn't come together as well i will say the bass on 850 at least sort of has this 808 bounce with a sort of classic upright bass melody woven in there it's a cool harmony and again the fact that it melds perfectly into middle passage is just masterfully done that's the thing i will say for as scattershot as i feel like conceptually the album can get which is my biggest complaint with it uh especially sonic leaning wise its sequencing is very well done and i think that the tracks bleed really well together and create an atmosphere all its own it again le leads to that more nurtured feeling experience that I was describing at the beginning of the review. And if anything, the racing bleeding in with that just creates a weird experience because of tracks like the intro of Superwoman or the no interlude. And again, the announcer being chopped up on Cape Coast and the cars again being sampled on Pit Stop. The racing aesthetic is just used so interestingly on here. I can't knock the fact that it does have a lot of ideas. I just kind of wish some of them were gone. I kind of wish some of the ideas were at least done better. I also kind of wish some of the tracks just had more going on. You know, while Champs Elysses utilized the backdrop of elegance to tell a story of excess and debauchery, I kind of like more how Telecolor used some melody play on top of that that I think 
IDK just does fantastically. I also kind of wish he went a bit harder on the track with Benny the Butcher. I mean, the track he did with Denzel was incredible, but working with another hardcore leaning dude, I kind of wanted more out of him, if I'm being honest. And I almost kind of wish more of tracks like Rabbit Stew cropped up. I love the bass groove on that, and I think that that track is pretty fucking great. I don't know, I'm at a weird impasse, because there's parts of this that I admire more and like more from Simple, but I think that Simple's consistency because of maybe its tightness led to a better experience in my opinion i like this still and i think that there's more that i do enjoy that i don't then that i don't uh, i think that the subject matter against uh some of these ideas is also an interesting portrait the concept is bold i just think it's not necessarily utilized holistically always the best or to its fullest I still give this album like a 7. I think that it is incredibly solid, and when it bangs, it bangs. But man, did it need just sort of a retooling of sorts. I did like this. I think that there were some tracks that I will definitely keep on rotation. See my own do my old fees, part ways like McCartney. Match made in heaven like Jabo Lashanti. Speaking of Katranata, I've been spinning Katramine. Katranata's newest full album collaboration with one Portland rapper, Amine, a rapper that I enjoy by and large. I've talked about him a couple of times on the channel. I've put him in playlists here and there. I think he's good at pulling a, an album experience together. Uh, I really like Forever. It's a track that I've had in rotation. I think that uh, it's a nice low-key summer bop that I feel like reflects both artists' personalities pretty well. It's smooth. And that showcases, as a whole, across this project, uh, for better or for worse. I enjoy a decent amount of this project. I do think the album gets off on a really good foot. I love the opener, who he is, and I think that it bleeds really well. And a Let's Talk About It, a song that I'll admit isn't my favorite on the record holistically, but I do think that the beat is really good. I think that the clip sample is a fun, like, behind-the-scenes sort of lead in to the Pharrell feature of Forever, which again is a summer bop in my eyes. But I think that uh, the Freddie Gibbs collaboration, I don't think it's my favorite feature I've heard from Freddie, but the track is still all right. I, I like Amine on it as well. Like, I'll be honest, I do like Big Sean on Master P. I think that the hook of that song is maybe a little too long, but I love the beat of that song. And I think that Big Sean just kind of rides those drums over that really ambient beat fantastically. I think the mixing on that track, and the mixing on the project by and large is its biggest uh, compliment I can give it. It all sounds incredibly well pulled together, and I would have expected nothing less. It's a rare instance of me just wanting more from parts of this project, you know what I mean? I enjoy the flow by and large, but there are some tracks that I kind of wish went on for a little longer. Like I said, I wasn't big on Freddie Gibbs' collaboration quite as much as others. Uh, but I also kind of wish more kind of went on on tracks like Sosa Sup. I kind of wish I would have loved to have stayed in Rebuke for as long as we stayed in I or in Uh Uh. I taps into that synth funk realm that... Uh, Snoop Dogg danced in the late 2000s pretty fucking well, and k and is this spacious outro that I would have expected from this project. There's a little pocket where I kind of just wish a little more had gone on. It's not a big knock to the album, I would say, because these two artists, more often than not, I think deliver some pretty consistent stuff. And while I've talked a lot about Amine's smoothness as a performer, he does come with that pen game that I really enjoy from him. In an instance separate from Simple, I was hoping and had an expectation for Amine as far as like what he can do, and a lot of it shines on here. I mean, I love who he is, and I think that he goes pretty well with Big Sean on Master P. They both have chemistry on there pretty well, in my opinion. But I also like that on tracks like Shut the Fuck Up 3 and West Side, that side of that, like, Amine banger 
comes out shining and has all the smoothness that I would expect with the K Trinata touch. And I think that it just comes together pretty fucking well, honestly. On K Tremina, I think that it's an album that I'll definitely have on my year end list. I just don't know quite how high it'll reach. But this is a collaboration that I do think works in a year where we have had other notable, really well done collaborations. This is another pretty good one. I'd give this like an 8 out of 10. Sleep Token were a band that was meant to be discussed on the 2021 Listening Log Update for December because uh, I checked out their that album, This Place Will Become Your Tomb, which I hadn't picked up since December 2021. It was an, al an album that like wowed me in a lot of ways. I thought the metal stuff was fine, if not a bit underutilized or kneecapped. But the, the deviations that they took warp my bag and that it's because that falls into that realm of like modern hard rock and metal adjacent stuff that's evolved in like electronic music like artists like inner shikari do it in a, in a better fashion but when they don't it also kind of just doesn't do anything for me and i feel like sleep token are just kind of the same bag but on their newest album take me to back to eden the metal elements both feel even more juxtaposed from some of the non-metal ideas, and the non-metal ideas that are here just continue to not be my bag. Um, I can see the idea they're wanting to do on a track like Chokehold, but I'm glad that it bleeds into the summoning. I think that the riffage on there is nice and dense and pretty well constructed. The same can be said of Vor. I enjoy Vor a pretty decent amount. I think that it's sort of ambient breakdown is its worst moment but when you're juxtaposing it against tracks like ascensionism and dywtylm which definitely try to lean more into where like i feel certain aspects of heavy metal bands are experimenting with with their sounds but i just don't think does it as good as those artists and even those artists i don't think consistently do it all that well see my complaints on the newest Inner Shikari record. I think my other big issue is just I don't like the vocals of this band, which I'm sure is done in a way to like keep the anonymous driven aspect of the band's uh, songwriting and overall mythos intact. Uh, I just think it kind of makes some of their better moments just have them give them this sort of uncanny valley effect that pulls me out of the experience. Uh, it's like watching the show Delocated, but it's trying to be like a serious metal band. Case in point, are you really okay? I like the, the chorus work, and I like the overall construction of that track, and I think that it has a strong uh, emotional resonance, but I think that just the vocals, not my bag on that track, and it's one of the stronger elements of the vocals doing something pretty good and while it works more again juxtapose against some of the riff work on a track like rain it's a project where i can see some of the appeal as a critic it's just that's where my preference comes into play i don't spin this kind of stuff and i think that there's musical elements that i just prefer to hear differently done differently and overall i think some experiments just don't work in my opinion i think that they're just not good musical ideas execution wise like a track a track like aqua regia just feels like it should hook me in with its enticing groove i don't dig it all that much although i do like the key breakdown like the, the little piano twinkling that happens in the track again some musical components i think are kind of cool i just don't like it all when it's mushed together. I'm giving this a 4 out of 10. It's not like the worst thing I've ever heard, but I the parts that turn me away do so like pretty intensely so. But there are moments that I do think are pretty solid. There aren't many, many moments that I would say are S tier in my opinion, but again, I think this may just be a case of it not being my bag. Boston Metalcore Icons on Earth dropped their newest album in five years, The Wretched, The Ruinous. 
but it's the first album I've really cared about of theirs since like 2011. I used to like Unearth. They were a band that I thought was pretty solid back in the day. And there's a pocket of their discography that I look upon pretty nostalgically. While I haven't cared about their stuff in about 11 years, I was like, you know what? Why not? And I'll be honest, I've heard worse from metal bands that I've checked up on in recent memory. I think that these guys know what they're doing at this point. And while I think that they could definitely use a little bit of a retooling of their production style, especially on this release, I don't think their drums have ever sounded this bad to me. Some tracks where I think the, the machine gun style snaring just really borders on like not good sounding. But the drum mixing on this project is inconsistent and not great in my opinion. I also think that there's just some breakdowns that I think would do them better to just beef their guitars up a little bit. I don't know. I still like this. I think this album kicks off on a good foot with the title track and I think it leads really well into Cremation of the Living. When the blast beats kicked in on that song, I was like, oh yeah, I'm fucking in for this, man. And I think that by and large, the album keeps a pretty solid momentum throughout a lot of this. It's very much what I should have expected from Unearth, but was happy to see them hit that mark. You know, while I, I, I've i talked about bands uh, like Cancer Bats and A Similar Breath, I do think that like as far as meeting your benchmark, Unearth are very much doing so on here. While it seems like cleaner vocals aren't as much of a focus for them, they do still crop up on pockets like on Broken Arrow, but moments like those are few and far between, and I'm kind of fine with it. I honestly think it's kind of weird when the interlude and aria comes in, because, yeah, it leads really well into the much more, like, melodically driven uh, rhythm-wise into the abyss, but, like, I don't know, it feels like a weird tangent that doesn't go anywhere. It would have been interesting to see them tool with that sound, but it feels like that's not this album's M.O., and I think that when it is just kind of giving you some nice riffage some decent breakdowns and some fun f playful solo work it does its job to give you like an example of where i think that like the production retooling could definitely work uh for the band the breakdown invicta and invictus pretty solid vocal layering's okay uh some of the fun guitar effects make sense it just kind of seems a little milk toast whereas dawn of the militant feels like a, a breakdown that should be like even more gargantuan i mean the the vocals layered in this dense fashion are saying i am death destroyer of worlds i feel like the guitar should definitely match that but as a whole this is pretty solid man i feel like if you enjoy this type of metalcore and as somebody who definitely used to talk up these guys to some people this hits a good pocket for me i'm gonna give this a six Alright, I was going to give it a 7, but I'm going to give it a 6. I need to cool it a little bit. I do like a decent chunk of this. I think. I also really do like the fun solo work on Into the Abyss, and the Closer Theaters of War has some really fun leads. Like, again, the points where this record shines, I think it's pretty fun. Some of the melodic guitar play was really fr fun to hear again, like on Call to Existence. It definitely evoked, reminded me why I do like pockets of this scene, but there are some parts of this that definitely could use a retooling the inconsistent drum production, and some of the breakdowns just feel like they could have been reworked a little better. But for a band playing the hits, so to speak, this does do a good thing. I could see somebody giving it a 7. I could see me, definitely 10 years ago, giving this like a like a 7, if not an 8. This is pretty solid. Definitely worth a spin, if you like that sort of thing. Hate me harder, hate me harder. There's not it feels like at this point, Kesha's been amidst the legal battle with industry fuckhead dr luke longer than she's been like not in it as a member of the industry and that's really shitty and i like that kesh has been using her music as a way to just vent a lot of that in the most nondescript way in the most artistically invigorating way possible I've enjoyed this second era of Kesha phenomenally, and I think that it's done everything to show any potential doubters that she really is like a, an artist with a good vision and a good way to just harness that into something 
and Gag Order, her third album released uh, post her return, sees her continuing to transcend the pop scope and present an album as album. You know, I talked about her 2020 album High Road is feeling a little self-indulgent, and I think it's because it didn't go... While it went, like, beyond Kesha's, you know, general realm of bombast, it didn't go to this level. It felt caught up in something, and I like that gag order gives an even more uncompromised sort of series of paint strokes from Kesha. I like a lot of the composition of this. I think the sequencing on this is sublime. I think that a lot of the first run of this album just flows incredibly well. Hell, the first couple times I was listening to it, I didn't realize that I was like transitioning into living my head when I was listening to it because it just it's so catchy and infectious and just mood building. It just flows so well and also sets a stage of pain, frustration, and a need for something bright while having this sort of educated perspective. And I think that it's a very well-written project in that regard. I think that it definitely understands its mood and it keeps it 1,000% of the way through it. Giving you some vibrant, fun, artistic diversions for Kesha. Only Love Can Save Us Now and Peace and Quiet have that auto-tune filled swagger Kesha that she just keeps bringing back to give us a little dose of where we heard her from the beginning expanded or tapping into that sort of grand swell balladry on a track like All I Need Is You and sticking the landing there. I also like the injections of beautiful vocal layering like on Eat the Acid. That shit sounds like some Imogen Heap uh, style Vocaloid pop and I'm here for it. I like the sort of isolated lonely synths on Fine Line. And I love the lyrics on that track. I think that it really hits to a, like a really strong emotional core. Uh, I think that that track in particular is like a highlight for me. It's like one of my favorites. And I love that the energy that comes in so early on the record almost gets spat back out. And the penultimate track, Hate Me Harder, it gives, it lends to the sort of arcing feel that this album feels like it's going through. You know, this album as a whole is an album-ass experience made by Kesha, and I think that it's so finely constructed. Even the interludes, like the Ram Dross interlude, Ram Das interlude, and the Only Love reprise, just feel like they lend to the arc of the project in a way that, like, some records just really fumble the bag on. I don't know. I like this a lot. You know, she knows how to make some really bold stuff, and I like to see her really go more so on that the more that she continues to make music post-Rainbow. I'm giving this an 8. I think that it's easily one of Kesha's best albums, and I think that it's absolutely going to be on my album of the year list somewhere. My dumbass forgot to record an outro. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this, give it a like. If you want to leave a comment on what you thought of these albums or some albums I should spin that have dropped this year, let me know in the comments down below. If you want to see more, consider subscribing. I drop two to four vids a week, depending on what I've got going on. Thank you again so very much for watching. I've been Viral Rack. You guys have a good day's lives and situations, and I'll see you another day.